And now, story time with Daniel Goldhorn. Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Goldhorn, and I'm here today to tell you about a story called The Director with a Very Big Head. Once upon a time, there was a director named M. Night Shyamalan, who had a very normal sized head. Mr. Shyamalan made a movie in 1999 called The Sixth Sense. It was very good and popular, and made him famous almost instantly. He made Unbreakable and Signs, both of them also quite successful. By now, he was known as the next Spielberg, a shooting star in Hollywood, and something strange began to happen to his head. People began to notice when he went to Touchstone with another movie idea. The producer liked the idea enough to fund it, even if they didn't understand it. But Mr. Shyamalan did not like that. So he walked away from the people trying to give him money for his movie. And then when the film finally did come out, it turns out Mr. Shyamalan had cast himself into his own movie as... A boy in the Midwest of this land will grow up in a home where your book will be on the shelf and spoken of often. This boy will become leader of this country. Your book will be the seeds of many of his great thoughts. Tragically, Mr. Shyamalan had achieved a very big head. And it showed in his next movie. We can't just stand here as an uninvolved observer. I need a second, okay? Just give me a second. We're not going to be one of those assholes on the news who watches a crime happen and not do something. But everything climaxed in 2010 when he adapted one of the most popular animated series of all time into one of the most infamous cinematic misfires of all time. Why don't we take a closer look at Mr. Shyamalan's The Last Airbender and see what trouble a very big head can lead you into. There are some movies whose problems are deep-rooted and only become apparent as you watch a good ways in. These are problems with the story and events not adding up. And then there are movies that in the very first shot show their colors clearly. I'm sorry. 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 Hey, it worked better that time. I thought about mom. Isn't that strange? Now, before I go any further, I want to set two ground rules. One, I don't want to complain about anything just because it's different from the show, only if I feel like it highlights some flaw inherent in the film. Second, I'm not going to make this a two hour long list of everything wrong in the movie. I don't want to take that much time out of your day. So instead I'm going to do a deep dive on this opening for now, because I feel it's pretty representative of the film as a whole. Basically imagine everything I'm about to show you and apply it over the rest of the film. Now where were we? Alright, she splashes him with water and he's not even wet. Fantastic start. This is Katara. This is Sokka. And yes, I'm going to be using the movie pronunciation of the names. I know it's different from the show's pronunciation, but that's just a surface level detail that has no real bearing on the movie's quality. We have bigger fish to fry, moving on. Speaking of frying fish, the pair of siblings are unsuccessfully looking for food when they find something under the ice. It emerges and reveals itself as a massive frozen sphere. Katara, do not hit that sphere! So here's where we see a major problem with this movie. The Last Airbender wants to adapt the entire first season of the animated series into a single film. That is 20 episodes times 22 minutes per episode, a total of seven and a third hours of story compressed into an hour and a half of screen time. That means the story has to be changed to be more streamlined while still carrying emotional weight. This scene fails at the latter for one particular reason. Why does Katara break the iceberg open? In the original series, she exclaims that the person inside is still alive and wants to break them out. We can see that she's panicking, thinking more with her heart. Here she just... kinda does it? No emotion behind it, no motivation other than the plot says so. This reasoning pervades most of the movie. Why do they decide this boy they found is their responsibility? Why do they join him on his quest? The plot said so, that's why. And the film is so dull and lifeless because of that, even during this inciting incident. Uncle, look! They bring the boy to their village and ask him about how he got there. I ran away from home. We got in a storm. We were forced under the water of the ocean. Oh, I see. It wasn't very smart. 
I was just upset. Oh my god. You're not still upset? Not as much as I was. Yes, their acting stays at this quality through the whole film. But honestly, I feel bad for them. Especially for Noah Ringer. He not only auditioned for this movie, he was asked by his Taekwondo instructor. When he met with M. Night Shyamalan and got the part, he was 11 years old. Anyone would have been excited. But here's the issue. You're taking this kid, with no acting experience, and thrusting him into the starring role of a major blockbuster picture with only a month of acting boot camp? That's hard, I don't think I could do that. So I'm not going to hate on the actor, especially when we account for the director and screenwriter here. Let me illustrate that point real quick with Mark Wahlberg. These two movies came out less than two years apart. One is directed by Martin Scorsese, the other is directed by Shyamalan. Let's compare the two, shall we? Unfortunately, this shithole has more fucking leaks than the Iraqi Navy. Fuck yourself. I'm tired from fucking your wife. How's your mother? Good, she's tired from fucking my father. The toxin? The toxin is affecting them? Do you have anyone in with Costello presently? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe fuck yourself. My theory on feds is they're like mushrooms. Feed them shit and keep them in the dark. The girls have a good day. Look, I don't know if you guys have heard about this article in the New York Times about honeybees vanishing. Who put the fucking cameras in this place? Oh, who the fuck are you? I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy. I hear you whispering. Planning on stealing something? No, ma'am, we're not. Plan on murdering me in my sleep? What? No. My point is, I don't blame the actors. I mean, this is Dev Patel. Slumdog millionaire Dev Patel. Handed this script and given God knows what direction, the odds were stacked against all these actors. Anyways, as they talk to the boy, the Fire Nation arrives. The Fire Nation is here. What? And they brought their machines. Except we see no machines. In fact, do we ever see them using machines in this movie? Um, no, not really. That's just a boat. Um, we see a tank getting driven over a bridge, but it's never used. Um, oh, we have these drill hats in the climax. That's, um, that's there. The movie constantly talks about the Fire Nation and their machines, but we never really see them rely on machines. It means to set up this theme contrasting industrialism against spirituality, but the story does not support this theme enough. So within the first 10 minutes, we've got no character motivations, lackluster acting, self-contradictory writing, and yes, it continues this way through the entire goddamn movie. With this much established, we can move on to other elements, such as... Every story needs to take place somewhere, and this movie takes place in a very strange version of the world of Avatar. But this presents a problem to me. Like I said, I want to judge this movie based on its own virtues and flaws, rather than how it differs from the source material. That's difficult to do here since the world of Avatar The Last Airbender is so entrenched in my mind. I might interpret things differently as my brain fills in the gaps with the show's mythology. If only I had someone I knew who has never seen the show. Huh, whoever could that be? Why, it's my good friend Reynard. How you doing, buddy? Say, you've never seen Avatar The Last Airbender. Why don't you join me in talking about the movie? Uh, no, no, get, get. Okay, so from what this movie tells you, without taking anything from the show into consideration, what can you tell me about how bending works? Uh, the Last Airbender is a world where you can have a snowball fight with just about anything. Snow, earth, fire, air, the water, the ocean. But who has access to this saving power? I honestly couldn't tell you. Katara, for instance, is apparently the only waterbender in the Southern Water Tribe, and yet everyone in the Northern Water Tribe appears to be able to waterbend. The same goes for the Earthbenders that Aang lamely encourages when he's apprehended. So somehow bending is both incredibly common and super rare. When it comes to bending itself, it's arm flapping to little avail. Scrolls are apparently necessary to learn forms, and yet people can just kind of improv whenever slapstick is called for. If this is about harnessing the elements in a controlled way, handed down through training, I couldn't really tell. 
Bendy's used to build, the Northern Water Tribe reaches their fortifications when you meet them at the start, but it's mostly uh, used for fighting and what fighting it is. Everyone just kind of ends up doing a bad Matrix 2 impression, all flailing arms and speed ramps. Uh, speaking of which, the film's treatment of violence resulting from bending is really all over the place. By and large, it's, it's really soft and cartoonish. People get hit with fireballs and have no signs of burn damage afterwards, jump right back. But Zuko bears scars from his battle with his father. But when he infiltrates the Fire Nation encampment, Zuko incapacitates but does not kill anyone, as far as I can tell. And yet, in the close of the film, the good guys murder the uh, Fire Nation leader and the camera just lingers on them and as he just drowns in horrifying fashion. It's very shocking. Yeah, it's like the bending's a lot more confusing in this movie. Um, let me show you some stuff with how they handle bending in the show. Show no mercy! So it seems a lot more like there's differences between Zuko's firebending and what Katara is doing here. And it seems a lot more kind of like there's, I guess, a logic to what they're doing. I'm curious. What can you tell me about the war they're fighting? <laughs> um, uh, honestly, uh, not, not that much. I know the Fire Nation cat, and they have machines, allegedly. Oh yeah, I was talking about that earlier. Um, so I I think they, they want to control everything because th there are spirits that maintain a balance with the world, and they don't like that because they want to be their own masters, I think they say at one point. Um, but it just kind of feels like there needs to be a bad guy in the movie, so here we go. So. About halfway through the movie, we see Zuko disguise himself as the Blue Spirit. Tell me what you made of Zuko's character in this movie. You know, Zuko is the most perplexing part of the film and not really in an interesting way. He's clearly very driven by a desire to redeem himself in his father's eyes, whatever that takes. He's the zealot, essentially. Uh, yet through the Blue Spirit, he seems like they're trying to set up for some kind of redemption arc if this were to actually have become a franchise. He's very conflicted about his relationship to his father, as we learn through endless monologues. Um, with his infiltration of the firing cannon, we know that he's stealthy and skilled in combat and willing to go against people who have exiled him to get what he wants. Funny enough, that actually does track with what we see in the series. Though I believe he is, in fact, highly interesting there. <laughs> Speaking of other characters, at the end of the movie, or actually in the middle of the movie, uh, they go to the Northern Water Tribe and we meet Yue. What do you make of her role in the story? It's hard to have any sort of real emotional connection to a character in her so late in the story when all she does is wander around the city and flirt with, um... Sokka? Uh, I mean, admittedly, it's a really big ask to connect with any single character in this film. Yue is revealed to be a sort of store brand Princess Kaguya, this sacrificial lamb by the moon spirit who must give her life in order to restore balance after it has been killed. But, I mean, okay, bye? My condolences to the family, but I've barely met her, much less formed any sort of emotional connection to her. It feels like the movie is trying to generate this pathos by banking on gaining drama points with the audience by killing off the character. Yeah, in the show they did a lot more to build up her character and her relationship with the main trio. Finally, I want to know your interpretation on this. What is the role of the Avatar in this world as you understand it from the film? Well, I mean, up front in the, the title crawl that is both text on screen and read to me, which is super handy, it makes it fairly bland and literal. The Avatar is a mediator with the spirit world, whatever that means, maintaining a sort of balance that apparently the Fire Nation don't want. They also, I guess, have to be an airbender. That's alluded to a whole bunch of times, but they never really go into that at any kind of detail. Like, if they killed all the airbenders, which they did, minus Aang, couldn't an Avatar just pop up, you know, in a different tribe? But aside from being this kind of um, spiritual leader, 
uh, type figure. The Avatar is also supposed to be an inspirational and unifying voice for the people of the Avatar world, whatever it's called. Aang is frankly not that, as evidenced by a series of high school graduation speeches that he gives throughout the movie. Aang is also, if you'll excuse me, just super bratty. Having this massive responsibility thrust on you and being told you can't have a family or anything like that is a, it's a huge change. That's completely understandable to have a strong reaction to that. But the whole time, I just really wanted to send Aang to, to detention or something. It's a shame because one of the biggest aspects of his character is the fact that he's so afraid of this new responsibility, especially at a time when that responsibility is needed more than ever. <laughs> it you just know? didn't read in this version. Well, Reynard, I did have more questions for you, but I can mm -hmm. tell this movie is already making you suffer enough. I feel like you've helped me illustrate, though, that for fantasy movie, it just really sets up its fantastical world rather poorly. Thanks for joining me. I would say you're welcome, but I had to watch this movie. And for that, I owe you dearly. In the meantime, we can move on to... Film is a visual medium, and any movie worth its salt uses visual storytelling. What that means is using what's on the screen to communicate the emotional beats. Take this clip from Citizen Kane. I know it's so vanilla to use this as an example, but please bear with me. Charles Kane is being blackmailed. He's in a relatively powerless position, and so he's smaller in the frame. He feels less powerful, and therefore we the audience perceive him as smaller and less powerful. But then, he moves to take charge of the situation, and steps toward the camera until he is equal in stature. The visuals change as the dynamic of the conversation changes. I'm belaboring this point in this scene because this is how M. Night Shyamalan frames a conversation in this movie. We should go visit some of these towns, Ong. I need to tell you something. What is it, Ong? I ran away before they trained me to be the Avatar. I don't know how to bend the other elements. What is going on here? Shot reverse shot is already a boring way to frame a conversation, but these close-ups feel so uncomfortable. And for what? The close shots indicate that this is an intimate moment. And we almost get a little bit of that with the revelation that Aang ran away from his responsibility as the Avatar, because the Avatar can't have a family, before the movie cuts us off. So what, what if we found you? Teachers. Teachers to teach you bending. Which element would you have to learn first? Water. Water comes after air in the cycle. Air, water, earth, fire. This is just the plot being explained. This doesn't warrant a continued close-up. And because this is done in two shots, they have to keep cutting between the two, and it creates a discordant, almost on-edge feeling. The visual language in this entire movie makes no sense. Let me put it like this. If a good movie's cinematography looks like this, and a bad movie's cinematography looks like this, then The Last Airbender looks like this. Having a unique directorial voice doesn't mean much if you aren't saying anything coherent with it. God, who even was the cinematographer here? Let's see, um... The same man who helped shoot this, and this, and this, also shot this? As you know, I conducted a raid on the Great Library, which most said didn't even exist. Get on with it. I have found scrolls. Gosh, I wonder who the outlying variable was. So we're starting to circle in on what exactly is wrong with this movie. About 25 minutes in, we get this scene. The trio have been captured and brought to a prison camp, where the Fire Nation is holding Earthbenders. Almost immediately, Aang manages to incite a rebellion in a very underwhelming scene, to be honest. And it's underwhelming for one particular reason. It's almost entirely in one shot. Two and a half minutes of screen time are dominated almost entirely by the single, uncut shot, interrupted only twice very briefly. Now having a scene unfold within a single shot is very technically difficult. The movements of the actors and camera have to be planned out, there's almost no room for error. That's why you often hear buzz about entire films made to emulate a single take, like 1917 or Birdman. When you pull it off, you get something very impressive. And I imagine that's what the intent was here, for Shyamalan to show off his directing abilities. But did you hear what I said just a few seconds ago? The technique is impressive if you pull it off. One limitation it imposes on you is that without cuts, it becomes harder to convey the passage of time. So this scene has all the emotional weight of, we're sad and trapped. Hey guys, stop being sad. Okay, rebellion time. 
Imagine how much better this would be with just a single cut near the beginning of the scene to imply they'd been there a while. Katara running up to the sky from out of frame to shove him is hilarious. Imagine how much better this would be if it had cut to a close-up so we didn't see her actually running up to him. When the fighting starts, we can see these guys in the background just waiting for their cue. Imagine if we had cuts of different people fighting, showing a lot of action happening at once. The scene indicates that yes, Shyamalan can hold a shot for a long period of time and have things happen in it, and by doing so, the scene suffers for the sake of proving his ability. It's about showing off rather than serving the story. People think of me for movies as a hired gun. You know, I mean, I for sure think of myself as an independent filmmaker. I know I don't make independent films, but... Look, I'm not here to hate on M. Night Shyamalan. The man has made some genuinely really great movies. And even in recent years, he's proved again that he can tell good stories on the screen. But he's clearly sensitive to criticism. I made my first movie at 21, just got savaged. And then 23, savage. Then Six Sense, not so much savage, but definitely not good reviews. Did you hear that? He thinks he got not good reviews on the Sixth Sense. Certified Fresh, The Sixth Sense. Top 250 on IMDb, The Sixth Sense. Obviously I can't speak with any real authority on this, but hearing this and seeing how he stormed out on Disney, and the way he pushes back on critics, I have a feeling that he views his movies as an extension of himself. That could explain why he's so desperate for us to hear his artistic voice, even if it's unclear what he's even saying. Newsweek called him the next Spielberg, but the reason Steven Spielberg is so acclaimed is that he focuses on the need of the movie first. He takes his particular strengths and tastes and coheres them to the service of the film. Whenever he tries new things, it's to try to tell the story better. In fact, to quote one of those movies, the difference between the two gentlemen is that Shyamalan is so focused on whether he could that he didn't stop to think about whether he should. Yes, this is a distinctly Shyamalan movie. The problem is that it's more a Shyamalan movie than an Avatar The Last Airbender movie. And I think over time he's realized this. In 2019, he stated that he regretted taking on this production. In another interview with Vulture, he states, I have a style that creates a certain pace and a way of writing where I try to get nuances in one scene that help other scenes. It creates a very similar pacing in every movie. Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, Signs, and I believe the village were all the exact same length, so it's very bizarre. I guess also when I'm constructing the story in the script form, it must be that there's just an inherent kind of I need to be at this place in the story driving me. This kind of big blockbuster, an adaptation of 20 episodes of an all-ages cartoon, would be a challenge for anyone. But it seems pretty apparent that Shyamalan is way out of his comfort zone here, and the result is... well... <laughs> Avatar The Last Airbender is an exceptional show. The Last Airbender is an exceptionally poor movie. It suffers from broken writing, wooden acting, and nonsensical cinematography, all fueled by Shyamalan's need to make his creative voice heard. But while we can all hear it loud and clear, it's not saying anything intelligible through the entire runtime of this film. That concludes this video, thank you for tuning in today. If you have any other movies you'd like me to discuss, feel free to let me know in the comments below. And if you want more of me, you can follow me on Twitter or Letterboxd for more updates. Until next time, I'm Daniel Goldhorn, and thanks for watching.